What's good, team? It's your boy Ivo from YS Cards. A uh, huge shout out to the boys, Aaron, Nate, and a special shout out to Papa Slapstocks, number one in my heart. Um, but I know you guys are probably wondering, you know, who I am and, and why do I even care about what you have to say. Um, but the boys gave me an amazing opportunity to try and bring a little bit of a different perspective uh, to what's going on in the market right now. Um, you know, like the market correction or the market crash, like everyone wants to say. Um, the perspective I'm trying to bring is is two different perspectives, actually. The first is going to be uh, the perspective of the collectors, who are really the people that essentially drive the market. And then the second perspective is just kind of understanding the, the market as a whole, and then understanding also the companies that, that provide us with these products, right? Um, and I've seen a lot of people talk about like the correction or the crash or whatever, um, but I've, I haven't really seen anyone go too in depth with it. Um, you know, not a knock on anybody that's, that's been doing videos or talking about it or anything like that. Um, I, I just think that there's, there's so much more that we can go into with this. And I feel like it's not really being talked about, uh, too properly. Um, but I think, uh, Jamil hit the nail on the head, um, in the last couple of videos that he's been talking about it. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's a time where it's essentially adapt or die, where you, we just have to start getting smarter and smarter with the cards that we're buying with, uh, our knowledge on the market in general. And then also he's saying that, you know, that th this correction is good for the market and I would take that almost a step further and say that this correction is the best thing that's happened to this market since the introduction of breaks. Um, and to really understand that, uh, we're going to have to go kind of all the way back to 2020 here just to get a full market overview, right? Um, so I would contribute Logan Paul's like first booster box break. Uh, as the beginning of, of this incredible uptick in the market over the last year and a half. Um, and from that point, essentially, the market has just been on an upward trajectory, right? I mean, obviously, September, October, there was a little bit of a, of a blip here and there. Um, but I think that with that strong rookie class for football, uh, Herbert starting in week, week three, and there were a couple record sales around that time. Like, I know the Luca for 4.6 sold around that time. Uh, you know, things of that nature kind of carried it through the first correction. Um, but now we're at the real market correction, right? Um, and I think everyone's almost uh, a little chicken littling it. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? Um, but I think that the people that are really like, oh, the market is super crashing, like we're going back to the junk uh, wax era days, all of that, um, I think that's a little bit uh, over-exaggerated and almost overextending the truth of what is going on here. Um, and to really understand what's going on, you have to first understand what drives this market. Um, and what drives this market is collectors. You know, there, there's a reason why this market has been around since the 1920s. There's a reason why... You know, cards have been collected by so trade everything since the 20s, and it's only because of collectors. Um, and, and these collectors are what really bring the intrinsic value to this market. Because if you have, if you want to understand a collective's mindset, collector's mindset, um, essentially it's buying a card and looking at that card and being like, can I hold this card for 10 years? And if I hold this card for 10 years, uh, what is going to happen to the price? Is it going to exponentially increase? Is there a possibility for it to decrease? Like, you know, you have to do your own evaluation on the card, essentially. Um, almost like you're holding a long-term stock, right, for 10 years. Um, and the way that they look at these things and, and the collectors go for cards in general is going to be anything that's low pop, uh, anything that's uh, low numbered parallels, parallels in general, or essentially basically anything that's not base, right? Um, and I think that we're seeing that that huge drop in base uh, all across the board right now. And I think that there's there's a very good reason for it. Um, those prices were overinflated to begin with. I mean, you know, LeBron's base Chrome selling for what forty five thousand, and KD selling for fifteen, sixteen, something like that. 
Um, I mean, Luca, Zion, I think all these prices have been artificially inflated by people that have just been kind of coming into the market, um, especially after all the Logan Paul stuff, um, that just see dollar signs in their eyes and they don't really understand, you know, what drives the market. Um, and another thing to consider is that the way collectors look at these cards isn't just for the monetary value of these cards. Um, I think that a, a bigger role rather than just a monetary value is the emotional side of this. Um, because what people don't understand is, is the collectors look at this as so, as so much more than cards. They look at it as, as pieces of art, pieces of their collection, something that they can display proudly. Maybe it's their favorite player. Maybe it's their favorite team and they're trying to collect all the rookies from the team. Um, and it, it brings out almost that kid in you, right? Like it takes you back to when you're four years old and you know, you're ripping your first pack with your, your parents, your brother, your sister by yourself or, or whatever it may be. Um, I mean, just speaking from personal experience, you know, a huge Bucks fan, obviously, uh, Giannis is my number one PC. Um, I also really love Dame. I think he's an amazing player. I love everything about his game. Um, but when I see like a, a Giannis PSA 10, right, or uh, um, in Dallas, I was actually able to see um, Dame's like logo man, you know, like his one of one chase card that everyone is going after. And, and when I look at that card, I like get all like warm and fuzzy inside. Like I almost feel like uh, uh, Agnes from Despicable Me, you know, sitting there like, it's so fluffy, right? Um, I just, you know, it just brings out emotions in people and it gives people the ability to invest in players that, you know, otherwise that they couldn't like, you can't buy a stock of Luca, but you can buy a low numbered Luca parallel. That's essentially the same thing as, as buying stock in Luca, because you're like, okay, this is a, a higher end card. This is a player that I believe in and, and I'm going to have to have a long-term hold in this for me to be able to either turn a profit or just enjoy having the card in my collection and, and passing it on to my kids or whatever. Um, so I think that's, that's really hard for a lot of people to understand. Um, just cause they just view it as, as like a piece of cardboard. Like how can you, how can you have emotions about a piece of cardboard? Right. Um, but I think that that's, that's one of the things that's really hard for people to understand. And, but that is the main driver of this market is emotions. I mean, it's a basic psychological need of human beings. It's a basic driver, a motivator. It, it, almost all of our decisions are, are made off of emotions in, like in one way or another. Um, so I think that understanding that what actually brings the intrinsic value to these cards is the fact that there are collectors that know what they're doing. They've been in the market for 30, 40, 50 years. They know what they're going after, they know what they want to buy, and they know how long they're going to hold it. And buying these low pop, low parallel cards, um, we'll get more into the numbers and some graphs later, uh, but what you're going to see it happen is when there's dips in the market, those cards are going to plateau. And when, when those cards plateau, that's where their tr intrinsic value lies. Because collectors of, of this stature that have exuberance amount of money to spend uh, on these types of cards, right? They're not going to sell at a dip. They're, they're not, they're holding this card for all the ups and downs. They're holding this card for everything. And maybe if they see a card, you know, hit a high or an all time high, or even just a value that they're comfortable with liquidating the card and, and moving it into another asset, um, th then they're going to do that, but they're never selling at dips. It's, it's just not going to happen because they know better than to sell at dips. Um, now, obviously, there are times when you do need to take a loss. Um, you do need to take your money and run uh, because the biggest thing in this in this market is always going to be liquidity, making sure that you're always able to move, pivot, um, just being able to have the flexibility to do whatever you need, right? Um, but really understanding that it's the collectors that drive this market and bring that intrinsic value to these cards, um, I think it's a big thing that everybody really needs to kind of understand and really take into account more uh, just in general. I mean, let's think about kind of the, uh, the base market of everything that's happening right now. And uh, I think just like easy, easy measure for it 
is uh, like a Luca base 10, right? That card got up all the way to, I think, like $1,930 or something like that. Um, with, with a population of like 17,000 in a PSA 10 and 30,000 total pop, um, to me, like there's there's no intrinsic value there with that card. It's, it's solely based off of the market because you could – get this card in a cello, a blaster, a hanger, a mega. You don't have to spend money on a hobby. You don't have to rip thousands of dollars worth of packs to be able to pull this card. You you can get a $5 cello at Target and get a Luca and, and just toss it off to PSA and go about your day, right? So the, the base market, even though these players are still performing well, at the end of the day, Things that are super, super high population, like especially like Luca and Zion, they're always going to be on a downtrend if you look over the course of time, just specifically because of the population count. The market can get flooded at any second. Um, there's so many sales every single month, every single day, every week, every hour, whatever time frame you want to use, but there's always sales. This card's always moving. Um, so there's, there's no way... For someone to be able to either like not control the market, but just to just to have a standpoint where you think this card is valued at. Um, personally, I think both of them are still overvalued, even at at the 40, 50 percent loss that they've taken just because of the high population count. Right. Um, and I think a, a, another perfect example of this is the Lamello Orange Cracked Ice 10 that just sold for like twenty eight thousand dollars. Right. So people are looking at that card and they're like, oh, this is a young player that's unproven. Why in the heck is one of his first parallels that's in a PSA 10 selling for $28,000? Um, but if you think of it from a collector's perspective, right, um, you know, think about it this way. If LaMelo wins two MVPs and three rings and in 15 years retires and is a Hall of Famer, that, that card is very low numbered. Like that card is is going to be worth anywhere from seventy five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you know, no offense to to Lonzo or Leangelo, but the, he's the first ball brother to really come out right away and be a superstar. And with Lavar's marketing and everything that he's done with the ball brothers, um, his name just it brings so much. And he also plays with he plays with finesse. He plays with grit. He's just a, he's an entertainer. He's a fun player to watch. So his market is always going to be going up unless he, you know, if he's good, I mean, like if he continues to play at the level that he's playing and what he showed in his rookie year, that card's value is only going to go up. And I personally think for a low serial numbered um, player that has a potential to be a star, uh, 28,000 isn't that bad for it. I mean, like, yeah, I understand that's overinflated and especially it's first to market. But if you look at it as a long term investment over 10 to 15 years, I think that that person is probably going to do very well in that card. Um, and then the second part that I kind of want to uh, bring a perspective into is just going to be, uh, you know, Tops and Panini, right? We have to realize that Tops and Panini are a company. And they're going to do whatever they can to make as much money as possible. Um, so let's say for simple measure that uh, Prism cost, the print run of Prism cost Panini uh, $50 million in 2019. I'm just using just some random baseline number, right? And then they come into 2021. They see all the content consumption. They see all the content creation. They see people camping outside of stores. They see the entire market booming. So they're like, all right, I'm willing to spend $150 million, um, on this print run for 2020, right? And then the next year, they see it continue to go up, to continue to go up. They'll go for $300 million, $400 million, $500 million because the, the demand right now is greatly, greatly outweighing the supply. Um, so they're just trying to flood the market with everything that they can because they know that they're going to sell. Um, I think a perfect example of this is Select Retail this year. Um, Select has, has been great in the hobby for a really long time, especially graded cards. Um, they always hold their value, uh, their fan favorites. And every time that, you know, there's a rumor that it might go retail, everyone starts going nuts over it. 
Um, so Panini sees this and they're like, okay, let's make this our biggest release of the year. Um, and in my opinion, I think that Select is going to be their biggest release of the year because it's been in print already for, what, two, three months? It's still going strong. I mean, the data on last week alone, uh, just Target itself sold 57,000 individual mega boxes. And that's just megas. So if you think about that, I mean, you know, $57,000 in one or 57,000 megas in one day right uh, on top of the blasters on top of the hangers on top of the cellos you know that's just one example i mean they're expanding the entire soccer market ufc is completely being revamped f1 is being introduced i mean they did mosaic draft picks for football um th there's just so many new products and and what they're going to do is they're going to oversaturate this market and i think that's that's kind of what we're seeing already now is that there's just so much product everywhere and there's so much consumption everywhere that especially with singles um, and it, it, even with these parallels, more people are pulling them every single day. More people are just opening packs, ripping packs, especially breakers that do, you know, full, full, full case breaks. Um, you know, there's just so much more availability of these cards, like not how it used to be back in the day where, you know, you might pull a gold uh, like Luca. Let's say you might pull a gold Luca and, you know, two, it won't, someone else won't pull it for another year and a half just because not that many people were ripping Prism Hobby in 2018, right? So now you have to realize that there is an oversaturation um, and this is kind of why you're seeing this dip because there's just so much in the market. Uh, all the grading services are closed, right? Or the two biggest grading services are closed. Um, and and the, the single market is flooded. So when the single market is flooded and these prices keep going down, that also devalues not only the rest of the market, but specifically that player's graded cards. So with that oversaturation that's part of the correction but i think the correction is more of the fact that you know this is like any other market it's gonna go up it's gonna go down um and i think that the prices that it was when it hit february were just insanely insanely overinflated. there were cards that were selling um in my baseline opinion of four, five, six, seven hundred times um, their actual intrinsic value, or 700 percent, I'm sorry, uh, of their intrinsic value. And there were just sales going on. Everyone was buying like crazy, spending money like crazy. I mean, the second stimulus just hit. So th there was a lot of money in the market, but the money wasn't being spent properly, in my opinion. Not, not, not saying that it wasn't spent properly, just more of the fact uh, that the entire market w was just a bit overinflated and a lot of people were just buying base cards and just betting on the player because everything was going up, right? Um, so, you know, closing out with all of that, I just want to transition uh, just kind of into some graphs and, and doing just a little bit of easy numbers um, and just some visuals so we can better understand kind of what we're talking about here. Um, quick shout out while we, while we get over to these to Aaron and the boys, they gave me some, uh, beta access to slab stocks pro so that we can, uh, go over everything today. Um, for, for a product that's, uh, in beta version, uh, the UI is great. Um, searching, just navigating is seamless. So I can't wait for you to guys, uh, to be able to use this, um, especially because it's free to the community. Um, I love what the guys are doing for the hobby. So make sure you support them as much as they can on this platform because it truly is a good platform. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, just a Trey Young prism. Um, you know, this kid has, uh, he, he won a playoff series before Luca did. He's been balling in the playoffs. He is a true talent. Um, I really believe in him. I really like him a lot. Um, I personally have uh, some cards of his that are that are you know a little bit longer term hold here um but everyone's still like oh he he had an amazing season he got his first playoff win you know what's going on with this graph um but then if if we look at his population count 
It's a bit lower than Luca's, but we're still at 9,500 for his 10, 10,000 for his 9, uh, and a total population of 20,443. So the, this is what I'm saying is like, the, I think that this right here, this is his value. I think that this $300, 330, 350, between 300 and 350, I think that's a great value for this card at the population that it's at. I mean, just looking at all the sales history, right? You know, I could keep keep scrolling, keep scrolling for 20, 30 minutes on this, and you're just going to see so much sales data. And that's why the, these cards are just is are just going to continue to go down. Um, but if we look at his um, red out of 299, and I use I always use PSA nines when I'm doing these comparisons. Um, because I think that PSA nines, especially in the beginning of the player's market, right? In the beginning of the player's market, when someone sees a nine, that card is usually super undervalued. Like let's look in September of last year, you could have gotten a Trey Young PSA nine numbered out of 299 for $380, which is right now uh, around the value of what his base 10 is at. But then um, this is what I'm talking about with the plateaus and with it rising with the market is that we saw the first huge jump between August and September of last year in this market, right? Um, and then towards the end of September and October is when we saw that first dip. But there you see the big sale when the market went up. And then as soon as we got into our plateau, uh, as soon as we got into our dip here between September and uh, October, you see the car plateau. After October coming into November, the market started going back up. So guess what? This card started going back up with the market um, and then continued to just plateau because, you know, February, March is kind of where it started. Then it had a bigger sale between March and April. Um, and then it comes down to its baseline. Like this is this is where you see the intrinsic value in these cards, right? So you're so in September of last year, um, in the last dip of this market, this card sold for twelve twelve seventy five, right? And then we're seeing again the second dip in the market. We're at twelve twenty five. So th th this is a prime example of being able to see the intrinsic value of this card because this is where you know this card sold for twelve twenty five. Someone looked at this price. And everyone that owns this card just said, nope, not selling it. I'm just going to hold it because, you know, you believe in Trey Young. And I promise you, if he beats the 76ers, one of these cards is going to go up for sale and it's going to sell for close to $2,000, if not more. Um, the, the, the Trey has been playing wonderfully in the playoffs. I really, really like him as a player. Uh, I like the Hawks. They're a very good young team. So it's going to be very interesting to see – what happens with Trey's parallels this year. Um, so another easy uh, comparison that we can do here, um, like we were talking about Luca before, right? So let's go into just his uh, base PSA 10 here. His base PSA 10, again, same thing. Luca had almost an MVP type year, right? Um, and we're seeing his card go all the way up to uh, 1,931. And now it's dropping down all the way to the last sale uh, was actually for um, $802, uh, which is incredibly low um, based off of the, the past value of this card, which is at 1930. Uh, but again, let's think about this logically. Um, this card has a population of 17,115 in a PSA 10 with a total population of 30,000. Um, it just doesn't make logical sense for this car to be worth two thousand dollars. Um, it just doesn't. Like I understand that Luca has the the record setting basketball uh, card ever. I completely understand the hype behind Luca. I'm a huge Luca uh, fan and supporter. I think he's going to be uh, an amazing player in the future. But if you think about this logically, how do you possibly come to an evaluation of two thousand dollars for this card? Um, I, I think that. What you saw with a lot of these base cards is almost like a pump and dump of what's been going on. Like, uh, you know, perfect example of GameStop is 
you know, for GameStop to have a, a market cap of $5 billion just makes no sense when the company almost went bankrupt eight months ago, right? Um, and then, you know, it kept going up, kept going up. And then what happened? It came back down to the value that it's supposed to be at. Um, and the, the next uh, one that we'll go over um, kind of will show a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. Um, but it just, it, it, it makes no sense. Like my personal value for this card, I think that this card is going to settle around 600 to $650 uh, when it's all said and done. And that's simply because of the fact that, of Luca's card selling for 4.6 million and, and he's a great talent. Most people like Luca more than they like Trey, even though Trey so far has been um, a, a bit more successful in his career. I guess you can go off the playoff perspective. Um, but I still, I, th I still think $800 is too high. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but, but there's nothing holding this card up other than what someone randomly wants to pay for it on that day. Because there's nobody that that's really going to be holding this card right now because more than likely everyone that got into the market w had to have bought this card for a thousand dollars plus or you know i mean it hasn't been it hasn't been down to 800 900 um since what august of last year so so a majority of people more than likely paid over a thousand dollars for this card so unless you want to take that loss and move on um, uh, you know, sometimes you got to take the loss and, and use that liquidity to be able to buy something else and, and move into something better. Um, and just like, I, just like we did with the other one, let's look at Lucas out of 299 PSA nine. Like I said, always do PSA nine because they're a little bit better in comparative value. Um, same thing here in, in, in August and July, you have the ability to buy this car for $760, right? In a PSA nine, first big market uh, market influx going up, um, goes up to twenty eight hundred, then goes up to thirty eight fifty, and then boom, we see our first dip in the card. Guess what happens after the first dip? Plateau. Right away, as soon as, as the card stops going up and goes down, the card's gonna plateau, and then at, at the next market break, which is, I mean. February 8th, I don't know if there was like a huge PWCC auction or whatever, but all the data that I look at, February 8th is like one of the highest selling days I think I've seen like ever probably with the, with the most inflated prices. Um, we're at hit 47.50, right? And then someone's like, all right, first dip goes down to 4,000. It dips a little bit again, but then it comes right back up to 4,000. So you can see the intrinsic value line the, the the intrinsic value baseline for this card right now over the last six months is around thirty five hundred dollars and no matter you you saw it dip back and then it came back up and it's going to come back up to four thousand again um and then just again looking at the sales history no scrolling barely anything you know th these low pop low parallels that they're going to hold their value and they're going to hold their value through dips um, I mean, people are, you know, sky is falling. I'm losing 140% of my KD, you know, tops Chrome. While this Luca PSA 9, this isn't even a 10. His PSA 9 has consistently sat at the same value since uh, uh, October last year. Like consistently through both of the corrections in the market, these low pop parallels stay the same. Um, and, and this is this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say we need to start getting smarter. We need to start adapting um, to to what actually holds value, retains value, and has intrinsic value in this market, rather than um, just what's the hot thing right now. What is the thing that I can make a quick buck on? Um, even when you're going into lower end slabs. Just try and find lower end parallels. Like even if they're just parallels, um, like even if they're any type of color is always going to outperform base in the long run. Even if it's not numbered, like it's always going to outperform it simply for the fact that it's a shorter print. Um, it, it, it's always going to be a different type of variation that you can get color matches, things of that nature. Um, it, it, it's always going to help the cards value. Um, it's always going to keep that pop count down. 
um, because there, there's just no value in a card that has a, a PSA 10 population of 17,000. Well, not no value. There is value. I think the value is around 600 to 650 for Luca, um, but an astronomical uh, value of two thousand dollars just just doesn't make any logical sense to me. Um, no logical sense at all. And then the last example I'm going to use uh, is one that a lot of people have been talking about, um, and that's going to be Kevin Durant's uh, rookie base ten, right? So this is uh, this is a card that everyone is looking at, like. You know, it's a low pop. The PSA 10 count, I believe, is 972. Um, it, total pop is less than 1,100, I believe. Uh, or no, I think it's, I think it's like right under two, three thousand, something like that. Um, but everyone's like, you know, the, you know, the sky is falling. This card was just at, you know, 12,000, 14,000, or highest sale was 13,000, right? Um, and, and it's coming back down to this $4,000 value and everyone's panicking, like all the markets crashing, like it's going back to the junk wax era. But if you look at this over the last year, like back to July, right? This is where like these base cards always follow the market. They're always going to follow the market because even though this is a low pop, this is still a base card. No, you know, no matter how good the player is, no matter whether it's LeBron, whether it's Kobe, um, I think Jordan's the only exception to this because, you know, Jordan's Jordan. Um, but it, it it's not numbered. There's no auto. There's not there's no patch. There's no nothing. Uh, the, the low pop count um, is the reason why this card uh, has is retaining the value of four thousand dollars, because if you look at the first dip. It, within the first dip, like, you know, it got to its first record high of 6,500 uh, September 1st or 6,600. And then it came down to around the value of 3,500. And now it went up to, to you know, 13,000 or whatever it went up to. And now it's getting back to the intrinsic value of around thirty-five dollars to $4,000, which I think is a perfect value for this card. Um, it's a low pop. KD's a great player. Um, and I think at this type, at this type of price, uh, there's going to be a lot more collectors uh, and investors that look at this card and say, okay, a value of $4,000 is a fair valuation for this card. Um, but it, it's hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around it, especially if they've been in the hobby for 30, 40 years. It, it's hard for them to wrap their head around paying $13,000 $13, uh, for a base card, even if it's a low population. Uh, just because it, it it just doesn't it doesn't make sense to spend that kind of money when you can go buy uh, KD's parallels like his tops finest uh, numbered out of two ninety nine right super low population clean card obviously it's it's one step down from Chrome um, but numbered out of two ninety nine the card's market value is forty five hundred dollars that card that card should be worth the the ten or the eight or the 12 or whatever you kind of like in between that eight and 12 range. Um, and even then, you know, 13 is maybe a little bit high for that as well, because, you know, I get it, you know, KD is one of the best scorers of our generation. Um, but still you, you really need those, those big hitter cards it is where all the super high value is going to be for these. Um, I just think it's unrealistic for, for anyone to expect, um, collectors and, and the people that really drive this market uh, to be able to evaluate a card like this at $13,000. I, I just don't think it's realistic. Um, so just in general, kind of what I want everyone to, to take away from this um, is just try and change your mindset a little bit on uh, just how you view the market in general, what kind of research you do, um, and, and just better understand uh, the people that have been in this market for, you know, maybe 10 years, maybe five years, maybe the people that have been here through, through the, they didn't enter this market um, through this uptick. You have to understand it from people that have known this market for a really long time and studied this market. Um, they're the ones that really prop this up. They're the ones that are really going to be investing. They're the ones that are going to be setting prices for this. 
Um, and, and they're the ones that just really understand what a card's value is supposed to be at. Um, and that's where that intrinsic value lies. And that's where all the intrinsic value uh, in this market lies and it is going to continue to lie. It's not going to be, uh, you know, in, in base cards in, in any means necessary. And uh, so, you know, take away, just, just make sure you focus on the parallels. Make sure you focus on, you know, lower pop stuff. Even if you're doing low end slabs, just try and get parallels of people. If they're not numbered, that's fine. Just try and get like some blues or some red cracked ices or or just something that's different than base, right? Um, another thing to remember always is liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. Liquidity is king in this market. You need to be able to pivot. You need to be able to move, groove, shake, whatever you need to do. Uh, not only in your PC, in your longer term holds, um, be just, you know, because if you're if you're holding a longer term card, that, that base is just not going to do it. Um, and, and those parallels are always going to sell. They're always going to sell. People are always going to buy the parallels and they're always going to buy it for more than the at the intrinsic value or more than the intrinsic value, because more than likely those bigger parallels, the only people that are buying those are collectors or people that really know what they're doing and they're going to do a short term hold. They're going to do a little play on it or, you know, they're going to do whatever they, they, they need to do with that card. Um, but, but the higher end or the middle higher end uh, it is really where all the value comes from. So, uh, yeah, guys, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you guys. Uh, I hope you learned. I hope you learned a bunch through our, our, our short time here. Um, but, you know, leave any feedback in the comments. It would be greatly appreciated. Uh, big shout out to the Slap Sox boys again. And, uh, yeah, cheers.